What's up, investors? Chase here from the Node NBA podcast. On this week's episode, we have two very special guests as we continue our May, the month of seconds, where we talk all about, well, we don't talk all about seconds investing, but we've tried to focus a lot on seconds investing. On this week's show, we have two investors that do a lot of investing in seconds. We have one gentleman who's done first and seconds, and he's now primarily shifted his business towards seconds. So they answer questions for us regarding case studies, due diligence, the differences between the due diligence of first and seconds. They give a lot of really great resources for those that are interested in jumping into the seconds space. Without further ado, be sure to check out this week's episode right now. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Node NBA podcast, your home for Node Investing on iTunes. I am Chase Thompson, not once again joined by Robert Woods. This, uh, this big bear in California has just consumed all of Mr. Woods' time and effort, and he's not been able to join us for a while. But again, we are very excited to talk about that project when we're able to talk about the project. He kind of leaked a small photo about what's going on on his... Facebook, potentially Instagram. Anyway, I'll link it up regardless in the show notes about what he is doing out in California. Uh, so we're really, really pumped about that. Whenever we can talk about it, we will be talking about it. But today I have not one, not two, but three people joining me. Collectively, they, they're going to be fantastic. I'm very excited about it. May has been the month of seconds the entire time here on the Node NBA podcast. And so we've talked to Faquan, who's kind of the fund manager. We talked to Franco, the attorney on Ohio, who handles a ton of different seconds and, and firsts and uh, CFDs and all that kind of stuff happening out there. Today, I wanted to kind of get that investor mindset, that kind of investor experience, kind of boots on the ground. Um, it's one of the things that has been kind of a cornerstone to our show for so long. And so I wanted to jump in with two people who've previously been on the show. Kimberly Banks Fawcett and Gabe Cass will be joining us. And then, of course, David Glinsky is back from his tour to Europe and other such Eastern Bloc countries and what have you. So we just, it's going to be a good show. I'm very excited today about what we'll be talking about. So uh, real quick, because you're another member of the show, David, why don't you let us know what's going on? You like literally got back, jumped immediately. Like I, I was like, you got back into town and then I checked Snapchat and you were like headed to like a closing or like uh, another, uh, like putting a listing up or something. You like immediately yeah. jumped back into real estate. I love that. Yeah. As soon as I got back, it just, uh, I didn't really have time to relax. I didn't even have time for that, you know, vacation. Wait, wait, tell me. You didn't have time vacation. to relax. You did, right, go, like, for, like, a month to your, right? I'm not, I'm not mistaken here on that? No, no, you're right. But you okay, know how, like, sure. you want to get back, and then you want that kind of, like, that buffered time to, like, jet lag and get back into everything? Nothing. Yeah, I just kind yeah. of hit the job running back tell into me, everything. And... Tell me more. Tell me more about that, about that time. That you, no, I'm just kidding. No, that's fantastic. So you jumped right back in. You had, uh, was it a listing? What was it that you, that you did right off the, like, it was like the next day. You like had a Snapchat where you yeah, were like all bearded uh, out and like hair pulled back and all that. And you were like the before, the after, and you were all shaved up, cleaned up, ready to go to work. And then like the very next snap was like you in front of a listing. Yeah, the very next thing was just showing houses because uh, I'm still doing the real estate, like the realtor thing. So went right to showing some houses for some investor clients that I've got here. And, uh, and then after that, it went right to uh, working on one of my flips. So, uh, yeah, I mean, you got to do what you got to do. It's all about the hustle. So. And listen, I agree. You've got to be able to afford the gallivanting about in Eastern black countries and what have you. I, I love it. I'm all about it. It's fantastic. So like I mentioned, we have Kimberly Banks Fawcett and Gabe Cass. Both of them have appeared on the show before. Kimberly, you were episode 70 for anybody that is interested in checking out her previous episode. Of course, we'll link everything up in the show notes. Um, I'm assuming everything's been good since 50 weeks ago or whatever. <laughs> However, all long it's, been, it's been a long time. I'm assuming everything's still going well. All good. All good. Fantastic. Nothing to complain about. Lovely. And then Gabe, you were episode 68. So just a couple weeks uh, before Kimberly, you beat her to the punch. Congratulations, mm -hmm. sir. Uh, you were actually one of our first uh, uh, kind of like investor profile type individuals. So we appreciate you coming on. And you've gone through, jumped through hoops to be on today's show. You, you've had all kinds of kind of tech issues and what have you. Originally blaming on Steve Jobs, then Bill Gates. You went all the way to the top. <laughs> Bill Gates isn't even there anymore. It's like some other guy completely. And you just went all the way to the top with your problems. 
Here I am. Work through, work through the challenges. Work through the challenges. So today's entire episode is being recorded via video. So if you want to check that out, you can obviously jump over to our YouTube channel to watch all of the greatness that is the video for today. Before we jump into it, Gabe, what does your wall art right behind you mean? I'm just like, it's uh, is it, are those Chinese it characters, says, Japanese uh, characters? Yeah, Chinese. It says if you, if you work hard, you will reap great rewards. That's all. That's four characters. That's amazing. Well, I each character. I took up. The I know each character tells us tells a little more than uh, than an English character. It tells a lot more. That's amazing. I love that. That's like a paragraph with it. That's tremendous. I love that. All righty. So let's jump right into it. Uh, so we wanted to talk, obviously, seconds. Um, both of you are very comfortable in the first and second space. You've both done a, a ton of investing there. Um, and so I just wanted to talk a little bit about that. So the first thing that I wanted to go over uh, with each one of you is just a couple of deals, maybe some case studies. You don't obviously have to have all of the numbers, you know, like nailed down or what have you, unless you just, it was either like just a, a a runaway success or a runaway failure and you just happen to have it like burned into your brain. But a couple of different mm -hmm. um, case studies or scenarios that you've come across uh, would be great just so we get an idea of where you're investing um, and, and the price points that you guys are looking at and all that kind of stuff. So Kimberly, uh, please get us started. Give us a couple of uh, a couple of deals, a couple of kind of case study numbers that you kind of throw at us uh, to kind of give us an idea of what we're looking at. Okay. Um, I currently have a second that I bought in Miami. Um, they were performing on their first, which is the way I like my seconds. Uh, so I didn't have to worry about getting foreclosed out. Plus, yeah, uh, the fair market value was about 260, and the balance on the first was 253. So even if for some wild reason we ended up in bankruptcy court, I wasn't going to get stripped. Mm -hmm. So that was. That what did nice. you pick this one up for? Did you? What was the? Um, I paid about 27 percent of UPD because. Okay. There's so much, it's much more secure than some seconds. So the UPB was about 66, I paid a little over 18. So not bad. And now they're modified. And she's been making her payments uh, for four months now. And we got $5,000 up front. So my first year ROI could be, what did, what did I write down? 54%? Okay. So that'll so be you nice. I was going to say, so you're saying the first four months have been paid. So we're in kind of May now, right? Mm -hmm. So depending on when someone's listening to the show, we're in May now, right? So mm -hmm. they made the first payment February, March, April, they've already made May? Is that yep. what I'm saying? Or it was yep. January through. Okay. So well, what, what, just as an aside, since you brought that up, what happened to her is we set her up on an ACH and she forgot about it. So one month she accidentally paid twice. <laughs> okay. Bummer. You okay. know? Wow. She still owes the money, so she, she, she's not super fun. Exactly. Um, so then you've got the rest of the year, obviously, to go through. Um, mm -hmm. And your first year looks really great, right? Because of the mm -hmm. 5000 down and then obviously all the payout and everything like that would be great. Uh, what does that look like moving forward, right? Like next 12 months, like how much, like how, what's the actual, is it a mod, modification? Like how does that work? What's the structure look like to that? Well, this particular deal, it's hard for me to really give you advanced numbers on that because... Mm -hmm. She had $45,000 in arrearages on this. Ooh. And we did not waive a dime of it. But we gave her, we offered her a dollar for dollar match. Fantastic. Okay. So like, this is something that we've obviously covered on the show a ton of times. And I, you know, Gabe, you can definitely speak to this whenever we jump to kind of your stuff, yeah. but there's a ton of different ways to work this out with people, right? You do dollar for dollar match or <clears throat> over and above, right? Like if you pay for every dollar you pay, we'll do two, three, mm -hmm. four, five, depending on how mm -hmm. much. Mm -hmm. So for you, that match got her to start working with you. Is that, is that what was necessary to get the ball moving forward? And, you know, cause you said you didn't, Obviously, right. you have anything, but like that got things moving. Well, I tend to go legal pretty quickly. Okay. I'll do a door knock, see who's there, let them know we want to talk to them. But if they don't respond, I go legal very fast. And she was worried about me foreclosing on her house. She doesn't want to Even from out. the position of a second? Yes. Like she knew just to go like, this is part of my mortgage, so I'm now still worried. Right. Well, she got the letter from the attorney. I don't bother to do well, the sure. internal, yeah. internal demand letter. I, that's just a waste of time. Um, so she immediately jumped in and said, I wanted to modify. And what, the way we set it up, I did give her a dollar for dollar match. So as soon as she made her $5,000 upfront payment, 
it was immediately 10,000 off of her arrearages. Uh, but if she does not pay off her arrearages by the time the loan matures, then everything else, then whatever's left is going to be a balloon payment. At the end. Okay. Very cool. And you said this was where? Uh, Miami. Miami. Okay. Fantastic. So, uh, and how yeah. did you go about picking up this deal? Was this the traditional grab seven, hope three or home runs, or was this, was this like a one-off situation? How'd you end up purchasing it? This was actually a one-off. Um, the first 16, I think it was, seconds that I bought, I bought in a big pool. So some were good, some weren't good, whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And then I learned that I really like the ones with a performing first. So I get pickier. So this was definitely a one-off. Now when I buy seconds, it's usually a one-off. Okay, that's fascinating. So, so you you buck that trend of yep. the traditional style of like I gotta I gotta get a stable of horses because some mm -hmm. of these are gonna be thoroughbreds, some of these are gonna be donkeys. <laughs> I gotta figure out what I'm gonna do here. So you mm -hmm. buck that trend now because because you can because you have more knowledge. But like, what? How are you able? Are you is your due diligence better? Because that'll be the second half of what mm -hmm. I want to talk about with you guys is the differences obviously in the seconds and first due diligence space. Is it you're so much better after buying a large pool and, and working through a ton of that at, at the due diligence side of it? Why is it that you're able to kind of really go against the, the normal grain of having to buy a bunch? Uh, I wouldn't say it's because my due diligence is better than anybody else's um, in the second space. Uh, I Wait, think did you say it is or you wouldn't say it is? I wouldn't say it is. Not oh, okay. I thought you said you, I was like, wow. So, okay. Yeah. All right, well. What I was going to follow up with is I think my due diligence is probably better in the first space because I take first and second due diligence and sort of put it together. Oh, more, I see. Like, oh, 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 okay, cool. So I'll look forward yeah. to kind of diving mm -hmm. in on that with you. Yeah. Okay, great. Interesting. Um, but having the, the, you know, the first big pool and seeing how much work it can be on a second that is not fairly secure, it, it, it really feels like more work than I want to do, quite frankly. Interesting. Uh, you can get a, and if you buy a note for $5,000 and you get a 400% return, that's still really not that much money. Well, you know? and so next we'll jump into kind of what you've got, Gabe, and, and David, feel free to jump in at any time you got any questions or whatever, but this is one of the things that we've been talking about internally, uh, Robbie and I, regarding some of the stuff that we're buying, um, we're buying, and we've talked about it a little bit on the show, but a lot more obviously internally about buying more expensive assets, buying, you know, 5% return on X value, right? Like, it's great to go make, like you're saying, right? 20% on a $10,000, right? But like, let's go make 6% on a $300,000 note. You know, like, it, like, you start to go and look at what are you, what are you actually making? Like, yes, the yields sound, you know, great. Obviously, we had Fuquan on now twice, right, on the show, but he mentioned it again a couple of weeks ago on the show where he says, you know, getting drunk off yields, right? Like that sounds great. And it technically is better than, you know, not making any, I guess, right? But mm -hmm. like at the same time, you do have to evaluate that. Like it looks great on paper to say 54%. And in your case, that's, that's great. <laughs> like that's, yeah. you know, but if you're sitting there at 4% on or 54% on 2000, as opposed to, you know, what you're talking about kind of regarding some of that other stuff, that's actually something that we've discussed internally. It, is it worth it? How do we, justify the portfolio and, and kind of start balancing that out a lot more as, as well. So any questions, David, before we jump over to Gabe? I'm kind of curious as to uh, what kind of ratio you buy your first and second. So like how many first two seconds do you buy usually? Hmm. Well, looking at the notes that I've bought uh, overall, I'd say I'm at about a third of them are seconds. So mostly firsts. And then there are a few contract deeds thrown in there. <laughs> Would you, uh, so you would, you would consider that, obviously it's a different class, but you wouldn't even go first on, like you just kind of, how are you, how are you, how's the ratio look if you include those in? Include which in? The the CFD, in? Like, so if you got first at like say half and then you've got a quarter mm -hmm. quarter, is that what you're maybe looking well, at? Well, I haven't done, I haven't done as many contract for deeds as I have mm -hmm. so I've probably done 10 or 12 contract for deeds. I like to pick those in specific markets where I have a great team. Right. Because frankly, they can be pretty ugly when you take them back. <laughs> <laughs> is what it is. Um, but currently, I'm buying mostly firsts because finding the seconds that have some equity and have a performing first, they're getting fewer and far between and they're getting more expensive. So if I'm going to pay that much, I might as well buy a first. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Very cool. Gabe, what do you got for us? What kind of, uh, what kind of deals have you been seeing? Uh, you got a couple that you want to throw away? <laughs> well, we've been buying more seconds than first in general. Yes. I, um, love, I love it. It's fantastic. For a couple of reasons. <laughs> For a couple of reasons. One, it takes a lot less capital to buy a second. And I like the risk return profile of seconds better than first, as long as you diversify across several at a time. So, so you're, you're more traditionally looking at that pool aspect, like we just got in talking about. And are you saying diversify across, you know, we've talked before on the show and, and we briefly talked about it with Laquan, but there's like four different buckets, right, of, of seconds. There's like, right. you know, with equity, with performing, non-performing with equity, you know, like, so you kind of, are you saying diversify yeah. across all of that and state and just the whole kit and caboodle diversification? Is that what you're talking about? Well, I'm mostly, lately it's been difficult to acquire pools of seconds. Right. So I've been cherry picking ones that look attractive to me regardless of where they're located. So I'm diversifying by buying so many, you know, each year. Right. And they're in different states. Um, On each second, I'm really looking at the borrower and, you know, what are the odds they're going to pay me? Are they fully employed? Are they paying the first mortgage? And if those things, if I can't collect any money from them, what does their house look like? And is it something that I want to own? Generally, for seconds investors, you're mostly concerned with the borrower. But as I've learned, many borrowers won't talk to you. So then you need to go after the house. Um, So our seconds are in many different states. I do prefer ones where the first mortgage is performing because it shows that the borrower wants to stay in the house. On occasion, We'll buy seconds with no equity um, just because they're pretty inexpensive and the house itself might eventually appreciate. With seconds, you have, the oppor- you have the option to do nothing with them. You can just put them in the file cabinet and wait for the house to appreciate, which is a little different than a first. Is that an so, actual strategy? I mean, I know it's- I Yeah, know it's called you, shelving. Right, right. It's like called shelving, shelving the loan. Shelving the loan, okay, uh-huh. all right. So if you have no equity now, but the house is appreciating, you may have equity in several years. And then you can, you have more leverage when trying to get the borrower to pay. Mm-hmm. So you can just wait. If you've only invested five or $10,000 in a loan, you can just wait, which is different than a first. And, and you're saying at that point, I, I, I mean, you're hoping that they don't move, that the market doesn't go obviously the other direction and kind of, a, but, but the lean still exists, right? Someone runs title, you're still there, yada, yada, yada. So that's uh-huh. you have the protection, right? Like that's, that's what you're, you're back. Right. And if they're paying their first mortgage and paying their taxes, everything will be fine. That, even if the house doesn't appreciate, they're still paying down the loan mm-hmm. and they're maintaining the house. So you gain leverage over time when the house appreciates or their first mortgage decreases. So that's always an option. Mm-hmm. We don't usually have that kind of patience, but it's definitely an option. I was going to say, that reminds me of like this sneaky, like, uh, like Monopoly board. Like we're out of nowhere. You like land on Oriental and it's got like a hotel in it. And you're like, wait, what would have? Oh, damn. Oh, damn. <laughs> now I'm totally in the lurch. David, it looks like you had a question mm-hmm. once something. Yeah, no, I wanted to um, maybe, Gabe, you could give us a uh, scenario as to uh, what an attractive deal looks like when you come across one, maybe you could describe it for us. Um, well, the first thing I'm looking at is the borrower's credit report. I want to see how consistently they're paying their first mortgage and how they're paying their other bills. Sometimes some borrowers are just delinquent on all kinds of bills. And the odds are they're not going to pay you. But then sometimes they're current on the first mortgage. I was just researching a second a few days ago. The borrower has a $600 BMW payment that he's current on. So the odds on that one say he will start paying soon. And then I I look at photos of the house on Google Maps and on Bing Maps, and I 
some houses look like they're very well maintained and they have nice toys out front. Those are the ones that I'm usually going after. So I'm looking for the story and how I think what the odds are they're going to pay. And then also I'm looking at their first mortgage payment because if they decide not to pay us, we will take the house subject to the first mortgage and rent it out and then collect the spread between the rent and the first mortgage payment. And I have a couple of good examples of that recently. So I was going to say, I wanted, I, I want to dive in on a little bit more deeper on the due diligence part, but like, I would love, love for you to, to kind of explain how that stuff has looked recently. Yeah, recently, uh, I'll give you an example near Athens, Georgia. Um, we have, we had a second on a townhome and the townhome was, is worth 90,000. And we know from the borrower's credit report, he only owed $36,000 left on the first but he would not talk to us at all. I mean, we did tons of loss mitigation, started legal, foreclosed, not one peep from the borrower during the entire thing. So we went to sale and now we end up owning this townhome subject to this $36,000 first. And we only paid, I think $5,000 for the second plus you know, $2,000 in foreclosure costs. And now we own this townhome. We can rent it out and keep paying the first mortgage or just sell it. We can just sell the townhome. I'm probably going to rent it out because I haven't been finding enough seconds to replace all the ones that I've worked through. I see. So a couple of questions pop up for me. Uh, anybody else? Yep. To jump in. So 5,000 acquisition, 2K legal, you know, maybe servicing or other kind of random cost in between here. So yeah. all in eight grand ish, right? 70, 7,500 grand ish, right? Uh, obviously not yeah. renting to recoup your costs there. Certainly, right? Covering the first, not, not a struggle there. So starting from that point, does the first know that you've already foreclosed? And then is there, what are there flags that are raised out of nowhere that like, you know, Surf City is like paying a bill now or like, how does, how does it work? Um, do you know, can you tell us who owns the first? Like, is it a big bank or is it, is it kind of a regional thing? Yeah, it's uh, USAA. USAA? USAA more than Oh, yeah. so either he or his spouse was a, was a vendor or some sort of uh, surf. Yeah, so um, interesting. do they know? Do they know that we own the house now? I don't know. But they're I'm mailing paid. in the monthly payment each month, and their first is still current. So I don't think it matters to them. Sure, sure. Um, and yeah. have you encountered a problem with that yet? Like, you know, having foreclosed and then, and then doing the bet? Have I encountered a problem with the bank? Yeah, like the bank or knowing no. now that you're paying the bill yet. Like do on On one count on that. I haven't seen that occur. I mean, we did have one foreclosure late last year from a second where the first refused to give us any information. And I needed information to keep it current, right? Or else they would have just foreclosed. So I had my lawyer write them a letter and say, hey, you need to give us information so we can pay off this loan because you have a lien on our house. So the lawyer wrote to them and then they just, and then they disclosed the information. But instead of paying off the loan, I just mail in the monthly payment. And, and that's it. <laughs> you're such a, you're, so, you're like a, you're like a note assassin. I love it. Just using your <laughs> yeah. superpowers. I love that. So, um, so that was an example where it worked out. So like you were seeing that, Rents were X, payment was Y, and, and you could you could cover that. Mm -hmm. How frequently are you and, seeing something yeah. like that? We've done this three times in the last few months. So we have three houses now in the last few months from that's foreclosing that's from second. That's pretty good. That's, and, pretty, that's, that's pretty good. It was not our primary strategy. The primary strategy generally on a second is to do a loan mod and have the homeowner just pay. But sometimes either they won't talk to you or they just have no money. So you have to continue. You can't just say, oh, forget it. <laughs> I was going to say, we all have right. strategies that are our primary strategies that just you know, don't always pan out. Um, and then, in fact, foreclosure states, you know, this process is fast. Either they're going to come to the table quickly or the process is over, basically. 
Um, are you finding that in a state like a Georgia or a Texas or something that has a fast foreclosure state that mm-hmm. it, it's even better, right, to go through a strategy where you're, you're having to, if you eventually have to foreclose or something, because it is so fast, like the first almost doesn't even have any, like their reaction time doesn't even exist in that, in that scenario. Because now by the time you're getting with them, they, they're, all, they're like, oh, crap, some, you know, something's happening. And then you're paying them and they're like, oh, well. I guess we're paying now. Like, I guess we're getting out. Like, is that, is that beneficial to you in that way? Yeah. Well, it's beneficial in that we can work through these loans faster. There is a little increased risk of the first foreclosing on you at this time. Because on one of the three houses that we just acquired, the homeowner was six months behind on the first. So they had already started that foreclosure before we had the deed to the house. So we had to reinstate right away the first or else they would have taken the house and we would have been done. Mm-hmm. So it can work against you if the first is foreclosing. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Uh, yeah. Interesting. What, okay. Mm-hmm. So we've kind of already talked briefly on some of it. So I'm going to get a little bit more dive a little deeper in that. Obviously both of y'all have mentioned credit now, right? Which mm-hmm. is something that is absolutely not, you know, part of the first process, except Kimberly, you, you, you obviously alluded to the fact that you kind of have this interesting hybrid now, which, which, mm-hmm. I, which I'm fascinated to kind of hear a little bit about. Um, anybody that's been paying attention to anything that we've been doing, we have a really kind of like great property search, uh, uh, due diligence kind of research tool coming out, which I would love to write, like try to try to hybridize, which would be great, right? Um, but kind of walk us through, you get a tape, you get, uh, you get a look at some assets or whatever. How, because both of you do have experience on both sides, is the first thing you jump into on a first, you, you immediately load it up, you're looking at the house, you're looking at the, you know, you're doing that business. And then, you know, you might do a little bit of borrower research or whatever. Is the first thing you're doing is like pulling the credit, looking at the borrower is obviously completely the reverse. Kimberly? Well, it, are you talking about specifically when I'm looking at seconds? Yes. Yeah, okay. So you immediately go to the credit reports. Because mm-hmm. um, it really is... 90% about the borrower. Um, so, you, you know, you want to check, just like Gabe was saying, how they're paying, what they're paying, how long they haven't been paying, why they ended up in this hole that they're in. Um, you can also see on their credit report if a lot of their problems ended up from some kind of medical problem. Um, oh, sure. yeah. So, you know, someone that is delinquent on everything because they got sick, that's, I think you're going to have a different approach versus someone that just bought a lot of toys and ended up in a hole. Mm-hmm. Um, and then once you're comfortable with the borrower and you have a feel for what they might do, obviously if there's no crystal ball, um, then, then I look at the house and I come up with you know, the, the value and how much equity there might be there, um, what the status of the first is, uh, if I wanna own the property, like Gabe was mentioning uh, in the end. Um, so it really is mostly about the borrower though. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, um, any right. services that you use uh, that obviously we wouldn't have brought up on the show before um, throughout this kind of month of seconds, mm-hmm. one of the ones that isn't something we typically use a lot, right? In the, in the first place would be something like TLO. Somewhere you're doing like borrower kind of like, like person research. Well, I actually do TLOs on my first. Well, well, yes, that's what I'm saying. You have this great yeah. habit. So like, what are, some, what are some great resources uh, for due diligence on a second that we might but I, use on first? I think one of the common misconceptions about TLO is it's, really, it's not a credit report. Um, right. It, yeah. It's just, frankly, a creepy amount of information you can get on someone. Like, I can tell you <laughs> where they parked their car last Tuesday. I, I mean, it's just... Is it, uh, so now this is just my, cause I, cause I, mm-hmm. I'm not as privy to it, right? As, as often, mm-hmm. is it the, uh, and it, really quick for us, this quick, Gabe, is TLO something you use as well? Yeah, okay. mostly for seconds. Right, right. Okay, so yeah. with a service like TLO, is it, is it at all something I can avoid? Like if I don't like check in on Facebook as often, like, wh- like where and how, like, is this, is this avoidable? Like, I don't plan on stop paying my bills. I'm just asking because I have heard numerous times like how, how crazy the detail is on, on a service like that. And you're just like, dude, 
there, is there a way to go off the grid from a service like that? Or is it just like, oh, if you're, no. if you're, a, if you're, if you're at all credit worthy, you're kind of in it. Yeah, pretty much. Um, and you pull up someone you, you like, you know, their town and possibly their middle initial. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you their social security number, their date of birth, every email address they've ever had, every phone number they've ever had. Wow. I can tell you the age of all of their cousins. I, I mean, it, and that <clears throat> report costs me a dollar. For anyone asking, I use an alias all the time. I've never <laughs> used my real name <laughs> ever in my business. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. David, you want to jump in before Gabe comes yeah, out? No, I was just going to make a joke. So, you, so I should start using this for like online dating. Just kind of check <laughs> there you out. Go. The girls. Yeah. Oh, 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 boy. David's new Tinder is, is, what I'm, is what I'm understanding. That would be illegal. <laughs> He's like, I'm swiping right on TLO. This is the way that I get down. Well, you know, it's interesting. You, you have to be interviewed. They actually come to your office and check and make sure there's a lock on your file cabinet, a password right. on the computer, a lock on your door, the whole nine yards. Plus, when you log in every single time, they have a list of questions you have to answer to find out whether you're, the particular search you're going to do, if you have a legal right to do that search. That is well, great and obvious and right. you know, all of those things, right? Like, mm -hmm. So that's, that's tremendous. Um, and what, what else? What else do you get? So TLO is obviously, so you start with the right. borrower and mm -hmm. credit. So who are, are you using Kroll? Are you just going to one of like the TransUnion or Experian? Like where are you pulling credit from? Well, that's an interesting question. In general, it seems to be hard for individual investors to get credit easily on their own. I mean, the, the process of, of being able to generate your own credit reports is even more complicated than the whole TLO thing, um, as it, I think it should be. Uh, is so, it an expense thing? No, it's like a security clearance else? kind of thing. Oh, I see. Yes. Yeah. Um, so most of the time, I will try and get credit from the seller. They'll give the credit report, hopefully a fairly recent one, and I can look at that. That's not something, I mean, with like a BPO, you can hedge your bets, offer, you know, hire a company that's going to make it higher for you or whatever. You can't do that with a credit report. A credit report's pretty much a credit report. Yeah. I mean, um, it's, yeah. And then sometimes sellers just won't give you a credit report. I was uh, working on a pool probably six months ago. Um, you know, it was almost a million dollars in UPB for the pool, and the seller wouldn't run credits for me. A million dollars in seconds. That is, well, I guess unless you've got like two, two half a million dollars seconds, I guess. But like, exactly. generally speaking, that's, uh, a, that's, a bunch of, that's a bunch of deals. Yeah, and they wouldn't run credit because it was too expensive. Well, how am You're, I supposed to buy your pool then? I, <laughs> right. So sometimes you can get your servicer to, you know, a servicer you have a really good relationship with um, to run some credits for you. Um, Interesting. You have to find your own source to run credit for you. Okay. So um, now, obviously, we've got to jump over to Gabe. Gabe, you're using TLO. You are, are doing some sort of uh, credit sourcing, right, as well. Are you finding that the, the seller is giving it to you more frequently? Obviously, you're buying more. So are mm -hmm. you pulling it in a different way than, than we have information on, or how are you doing it? No, I, I found the seller generally runs the credit report. It's the most safest way for this process to work. The seller is the note holder. Holder, they are the lender. They should be running the credit report, and generally, I find they do. But the challenge is on seconds. If a borrower has had a bankruptcy discharge, the mortgage often no longer reports on the credit report, so you don't have the information on the credit report, and that's when you have to start doing uh, like title research and looking things up in the with the county, you know, to see to see if there's been foreclosures or loan modifications or other signs of trouble with the first mortgage. So, and then you have to do a lot of research in PACER, which lets say, you access PACER the court you... records. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've spent a lot of time in PACER because a lot of these borrowers have had bankruptcy and their filings and PACERs tell you a lot. They tell you how much they owe on the first mortgage, how much income they have, all of their debt, what they want to do with the house. So there is a lot of time spent researching in PACER when you're buying seconds. And PACER uh, obviously will link up everything that we're talking about in the show notes for everybody. PACER is a really great service. Um, that's, is it, uh, it still 10 cents a page, right? If you got to like pull stuff up, print all that kind of business, right? But yeah, you know, right. that's, is that, okay. So definitely give me another resource if there's something else you're using that you're not necessarily using on a first, but 
now with the added expense, I mean, you said it costs you a dollar for TLO, like yeah, whatever, right? You go buy a Snickers, <laughs> but like there's obviously added expense. In I don't even think you could buy a Snickers for a dollar now, can you? I think it's like a buck 69. Exactly. It's crazy. <laughs> Back in my day. Anyway, um, so, so are you also then, once you've now decided, okay, this borrower looks like a promising scenario, this looks like something I can do, I've now researched something, then are you also then accruing traditional expenses like a BPO expense or those types of things? Or, you know, are you not as worried mm -hmm. if you're not thinking you're taking the home back? How does that no. I'm not usually running a BPO when buying a second, if the homeowner is current on their first mortgage, generally photos and values online are enough information about the house and comps. You know, I'll run all the comps on my own for free. And that's usually enough because the primary strategy on the second is generally loan mod. Mm -hmm. Taking the house is, is like a secondary strategy. Right. Sure, so sure, sure. I don't run... BPO in seconds. Um, I have done the drive-bys where the vendor just drives by, takes a photo, um, but it's not as much of a concern. Are you using something like a WeGo Look for that, or or some something else? Something, a couple different field service vendors. Okay, cool. They'll, I remember, they'll just drive by, take photos. I distinctly <laughs> remember. So this is we have yet to talk. We actually never talked about this on the show, though it was a massive issue on the back end. So the last time Gabe was on the show, I don't even remember the vendor's name. You might remember the vendor's name, but I don't remember the vendor's name. Anyway, you gave a really great vendor recommendation. Uh, and right. I was like, this is fantastic. So we tried to reach out to them to do business with them. We tried to reach out to have them come on the show, all this other business. We literally never heard back. There was no course. There was no. nothing. They fell off the map. It was bananas. Right. They stopped serving uh, very small investors, I believe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. It was. It was. It was. It was unfortunate because we were like super jacked. We we're like, oh, this is great. Yeah. Gabe gave us this great. He's. You know, he knows what he's doing. This is really cool. Uh, we're trying to bring resources to the people, right? To, to the. And. Uh, yeah. They were not. I have a couple other ones that I use now that I can send information <laughs> to you about. <laughs> okay. So we will include. But don't jinx yourself. Yeah, like, we're not bringing them up. Recommended the them well, I didn't say their name. <laughs> <laughs> we, we will not be mentioning them on the show, on the audio version, because one, I want to drive people to go to the show notes over at notabia.com. You know, that's mm -hmm. good. But mm -hmm. also, um, uh, <laughs> the, the shows are a little more evergreen, right? And like, I could just go in and like delete something off the website. But we will have additional resources from both Kimberly and Gabe sure. in the show notes at notabia.com. Yeah, uh, but I do have two field vendors who are good, and they're charged between thirty and forty dollars. So very reasonable. Okay, and is this something that you're like fifty percent of the time, eighty percent of the time, uh, incurring as a cost, or is it almost every time? I usually do it later after I purchase the second, um, just <laughs> just to get a picture of what the borrowers up to i mean are they taking care of the house does it look like they want to stay there do i want to acquire this house that kind of thing i like gabe's strategy of buying the cow then tasting the milk yeah. it's a great strategy no, but i, I, like I do something similar not necessarily the drive-by i might do a drive-by up front because i just want to make sure that you know the house is still standing mm -hmm. um but i'll order a bpo um if i start to get the inclination that this borrower might go bk on me because I want to be sure I have, I'm not going to get stripped. Mm -hmm. um, so, right. Correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Uh, Kimberly, yeah. speaking mm -hmm. of making sure the house uh, is still there, was it your, was it a second that was taken out by a like final destination slash like epic summer blockbuster global warming movie event catastrophe of a tornado? Didn't yes, that was a second. Um, that was part of that first big pool that I mentioned. Um, and when I was buying that, you know, I, I did really strong due diligence on stay the first. So did the wind. Yeah, exactly. The first 10 of the pool, and I knew I was going to make my money back on, say, seven of those 10. So the other ones, I, you know, I did some quick stuff, looked at the credit report, everything looked okay. Um, but the picture on Google was old 
So, uh, I, you know, I get it, I board it. Uh, as soon as the uh, uh, hello letter went out, the guy was immediately calling my servicer. Um, the, his house had been destroyed in a tornado a couple of years after the Google photo. So um, you didn't see the tornado like in the background as yeah. like the car is like driving by, right? It's like, uh, boop, 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 like getting closer to the house. Right? And the thing that's interesting is if you uh, search on Google for the name for the neighborhood name, there is video of the uh, there's video of the storm coming and video of the aftermath. Shut up. Are you serious? Oh, yeah. It's crazy. It is absolutely crazy. So like if you do like the Google Earth type, uh -huh. you could, oh my gosh, that's bananas. Yeah, it's wow. just. Where was this at? Was it in Oklahoma? Uh, Cleveland, Tennessee. Tennessee. Mm -hmm. okay. And it was actually a category five. Oh wow. yeah, that's tremendous. Wow. So like you yeah. get to see that thing just go right through the neighborhood. Oh yeah, oh yeah. And it took out two specific houses in the cul-de-sac. It just like blew across the street and just kept on going. Um, so. Would you say that that's what? like, would you say that's like the worst scenario you've had happen with like a second that you've bought? Actually, no. <laughs> uh, I will say it was the scariest phone call that I got on a second. I was like, what, what do you mean there's no house? Like, what? <laughs> um, wow. But because seconds are very interesting, the one of the things I like about seconds is you have no idea how it's going to turn out. I mean, you have a plan, but all kinds of things can happen, and you suddenly get this wild hair idea to go try that. Or that's what makes seconds fun to me. But anyway, um, it turned out he... At the time of the tornado, he was delinquent on his first. Not seriously, but delinquent. And they had, forced place, they had already put forced place insurance on him. So they got paid off completely because of the tornado. Mm -hmm. well, I was now technically in first position. And the lot, I paid 4000 for the note. The lot was worth 25000 So I had him give me twenty. So that's, I mean, a crazy return. Granted, on very little money, and but the fact that it was a nice return on a lack of a house, kind of <sighs> notes where you can make money even when there's no real estate. Exactly. Um, that's so. that's <laughs> bananas. Um, mm -hmm. So we haven't discussed a ton, right, of seconds on the show, which is why we kind of wanted to devote the entire month of it to this after paper source, where there was a ton of, uh, you know, just a ton of presentations, a lot of really great investors out there that were at that event that were obviously talking about it. Um, for the listener that is like binge listening, right? To like all hundred and, you know, whatever, 25 episodes or whatever, and they've, they've now made it this far, or they've been listening for a long time and haven't pulled the trigger on any note, uh, or have been doing first, but haven't done seconds or whatever. Um, what would you, what would you say to that investor? Like the, like you mentioned, Kimberly, that the inventory isn't quite where you'd want it to be for your type. Then you mm -hmm. got Gabe was like, I'm slam dunking on seconds right now. Reverse. Um, market seems to be as good as it would be in the first, right? It's as good as the effort you're putting in to find deals. It's as good as the effort as you're putting in to network and all that kind of stuff. Um, go for it. I mean, give it a go. They're a little cheaper. Like Gabe said, what would you say to, to that investor that's, that's now thinking about it a little bit? game <laughs> well you have to you have to jump in and you know learn you can start by placing bids mm -hmm. on first whether or not you get them is another thing but at least you go through all the due diligence practice mm -hmm. um, I would recommend probably buying a first before a second because seconds are kind of like you need to know everything about a first and then a little bit more so first is probably more appropriate for a beginner hmm. or even buy a, a re-performing loan as a, as one of your first notes. That way you kind of learn the processes, but you don't have to do the, do the full loss mitigation. That is the strategy I literally went with, right? Because then you set up, you get set up with your vendors, right? You get your, your doc storages now in place. Cause you got your, your docs, right? It's performing. You have that. Mm -hmm. You've got your, um, uh, servicers obviously in place because they're servicing the loan. Like you get a lot of this um, introduction you know, into the business a little yeah. bit more gently. A lot right? of practice. For sure. Yeah. For sure. And less risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about you, Kimberly? Well, I feel like a, a classic first investor versus a classic second investor, it's really a personality thing. I mean, if, if you 
if you like risk, if you like um, solving problems, I think seconds will appeal to you more. So I, like, right. I, I would agree with the idea of starting maybe with a re-performer or a performer so that you get used to the process. But I don't know, I don't know that I would agree you have to start with firsts. Um, what I always recommend to everybody is, you know, you, you've got to go to some, some educational sessions and learn the general, this is how it works on this asset class um, and figure out what appeals to you. So you just brought up an interesting thing mm -hmm. that I was thinking about this entire time and I just had to make a note of it or else I was going to forget. You mentioned different styles, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, like different people do differently. Now, both of y'all have had great success, like in this hybrid model of being able to do both. There isn't a ton of people that recommend that. Um, as a, as a general catch all, a lot of well, you were saying educators don't recommend it, right? Because they don't, they don't teach on both. So they're like, no, second, no, first, right? Exactly. Um, so you kind of get a little bit of like hyperbole, right? Mm -hmm. um, but in differences regarding personality types, y'all have both talked about pretty extensively borrower outreach here. And mm -hmm. that isn't something that you traditionally handle as much of on your own regarding a first, depending, right, on, on how the deal goes. But it really seems like almost every deal you guys have talked about thus far, there's been a decent amount of personal borrower outreach. How are you guys handling that? Are you doing more of that yourselves? Is it outsourceable as much as it is with a first? Um, mm -hmm. how's, what's that strategy look like? Either one of you jump in. Uh, you, you have to know your personality and what your strengths and interests are. <laughs> um, for me, I I would much rather be managing the portfolio and analyzing new investments than handling the borrower outreach. So I outsource the calling to a great loss mitigator that I use. It's good. Yeah. Um, but some people are much more people first people driven and like to talk to borrowers, and that's great for them. So maybe they should not outsource that type of task. So I would just focus on the part of the business you're interested in the most. Mm -hmm. I agree. Um, that could also be something if you had a partnership. Um, oh, yeah, sure. One's mm -hmm. doing the analytical and one's doing the talking to the borrowers. But for me, I started out trying to talk to my borrowers on my seconds. Uh, right. And I just, it just wasn't, I, it wasn't a good fit for me, which is interesting because I'll talk to anybody about anything. Um, <laughs> With especially this guy in the tornado. Uh, I mean, one of the biggest things he had, the, just not to give too much detail, but the entire concrete slab from his porch fell on him. So he spent a year having to learn how to swallow and talk and all oh, that. Oh, I thought you were about to say he spent a year under a slab or something. I was like, no. I was getting ready for this banana store. Exactly. They couldn't find him. <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, so, no, but all, he was injured and had to go through. Exactly. His and all he could say was, I was so glad that it didn't land on the kid. Oh my gosh, yeah. So, I mean, if I, if I really start to think about it, I can get a little choked up over this guy. And that was, what, a year and a half ago? Like, I don't... Um, and then there are other people, because we all know when you're trying to convince somebody of something, you don't necessarily lie, but you might emphasize some things so that they go your way. So if I'm talking to a borrower, I know to some extent they're lying to me. There's nuance. There's definitely going to be <laughs> Exactly. Um, and, <laughs> I love Gabe's laugh. That was very, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And you know what? Life is too short to deal with a whole bunch of liars. So mm. I would much rather just hire somebody else to talk to them and then give me the straight detail, tell me whether they think they were lying, whether it's true or they, uh, and go from there. I don't need to hear it directly. So. Right. I can think of, I just thought of a big difference with regards to borrower outreach for first versus second. You know, with first, People know they're not paying their first mortgage. That's not usually a question. <laughs> but with second, a lot of the times the borrower doesn't believe they have to pay the second. Mm -hmm. And that's a huge difference. They don't think that they don't think anything is gonna happen if they don't pay it. Like or it they think that the I bank see. gave up on it and they don't owe it. I so see. The, it's kind of different. There's more convincing with the second. Yeah. Mm. And a, a lot of seconds borrowers also do not believe you can foreclose from second position. Right. That's I'm why we start first. legal very quickly. Right. I'm paying my mm. first. You can't take my house. Uh, yeah, I can. Watch. 
<laughs> I, yeah, late late last year we had a high value California second, and the the house is worth almost nine hundred thousand dollars. And the borrower said, "You cannot foreclose on me from second." So of course I had to because there's no other conversations to have, right? Mm -hmm. They didn't believe it at all, even through the sale date. And it just went to sale and they lost the house. But <laughs> Gabe's like, challenge accepted, so, mother. No. <laughs> exactly. I was trying to help them, but once they say you can't foreclose, I mean, what else are you going to do but foreclose? Mm -hmm. right. uh, the borrower got lucky that prices are extremely high in Northern California right now. And the bidding went up to some crazy level. So they did receive quite a check after the sale. Oh, well, and you got paid but off. They have no more house. Oh, yeah. Well, there's that, right? <laughs> they got to move. Um, well, I appreciate everybody uh, taking the time today. This has uh, been just fantastic. Like, I, we've obviously mentioned numerous times we've never pulled the trigger on seconds, really focused on the first space. And um, it's always been something that's been really intriguing to me. I know a lot of people usually, you know, Gabe saying, you know, potentially do a first performing. And it was like, no, you know, go to town with whatever's going to, you know, kind of mesh with your style. Um, but the price point has been something that I've seen a lot of people, you know, especially when I, and I say when I first got in, like this was, you know, 30 years ago or something, but even just a couple of years ago, picking up a, a small pool, right? Five, six, seven seconds. Um, you could do that for the price of a first easily, right? Like you can still do that today, but like mm -hmm. easily for the price of a first. Um, and so they just got a lot of, they got a lot more swings. At bat, right? They got a lot more at bats, right? They got, okay, I'm going to, you know, we're going to work through this one. All right, that one was trash. Okay, we're gonna, you know, so they just got a lot more at bats. So that was a way and a strategy people were utilizing. Um, mm -hmm. And that to me is just, mm -hmm. just fascinating. So I appreciate you guys taking the time. David, any more questions uh, for our lovely guy? I've got one last quick question. Um, and I'm trying to think of this more from like the perspective of, uh, like, I, I don't know much about seconds. I'm still learning a lot about firsts. Um, and uh, as a new investor, uh, you tend to focus a lot on like all the good stuff about, you know, whatever investment you're making. So maybe if you can tell us a little bit about maybe some pitfalls or just some bad experiences you've had, not really to turn people off from buying seconds, but just to give more of a perspective of like, this is what could happen, that, that kind of stuff. Well, I've got a pretty easy one. It's in uh, Port Charlotte, Florida. Um, I only paid about 2,500 for it, so it wasn't a huge expense. But it's uninhabitable. It has been uninhabitable for probably three years now. Um, and the first doesn't exist anymore. It was some mortgage company called like Own It Mortgage. Yeah, like that's not the sound of mm -hmm. somebody trying to fraud, defraud somebody. Um, but somewhere, whoever currently has possession of this has thrown it in a drawer or it burned up in a fire. The first is not interested whatsoever in this property. Um, they've also sold the tax liens since 2010, but none of the tax holders want this hunk of junk either. So they're not foreclosing. They're not pushing a tax deed sale. <laughs> because they get their money whenever it goes anyway, right? Like. But those and expire eventually. They do expire. The 2010 yeah. has expired at this yeah. point. Um, but I've even reached out to all of the tax lien holders to try and buy their position. Stop it. Really? And they won't respond to me. Why so, has it been uninhabitable? Oh, it's just, uh, it might as well have been a tornado. I mean, it, it's just awful. Oh. It's terrible. And it, it no longer sits straight anymore. I mean, it, it's a teardown. It's absolutely a teardown. But the lot's worth some money, and the, all the houses in the neighborhood are worth 75, 80 grand. So I could tear down the house, I could build something if I wanted to, or I could flip it to an, you know, a local investor. There's all kinds of things that I could do with this if I could get somebody to respond. Is and I there can't, I can't foreclose. Like a quiet title scenario that you could maybe just like foreclose and kind of just quietly take over? Well, they're way underwater. So oh. I would be responsible for that from second position. Right. And the interesting thing is like <clears throat> Dave was talking about shelving loans. That's basically what I've done. I could take a loss on it, you know, just write off the $2,500 and whatever mm -hmm. the costs are. And 
but I just feel like I can do something with this. So I just let it sit there. I, Are you incurring any backlash from the county at all? Like, because you, you have this black, well, you wouldn't, because you're the second. They don't even know. I'm the second. Oh yeah. my gosh, what a bizarre scenario. And from time to time, we call the county and just ask, so how long are you going to let this sit before you tear down the house? Oh, we don't usually do that. Okay, <laughs> whatever. Is it, is, it, uh, is it in like a neighborhood type? Is it, is it mm -hmm. rural at all? Or is it like right next to somebody's house? Oh, it's right next to somebody's house. There is a vacant lot right next to it, but that's the only vacant lot in the neighborhood. I've actually driven by it. Um, and it's as bad in person as all of the photos that oh. I have. Um, but the neighborhood is absolutely adorable. It would be the perfect place to build a cute little three, two and go crazy. But I, I can't get title no matter what I try. Yeah. Oh, and I have tried. Okay, I've tried. Gabe. What, do you have any feedback for that and or scenario to answer David's question? <laughs> it sounds like she'll probably just write that one off <laughs> based on the how cheap it was and all the effort. Someday. Uh, but the, I think the main risk is the main risk is if you have a second with no equity and the borrower files chapter 13 bankruptcy, they can strip your lien. And mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest risk because I have one, well, I have several borrowers in bankruptcy, but there's one where we thought we had a lot of equity when we bought the second and we paid a lot of money for the second, right? So the borrower filed chapter 13 and says, hey, my house is worth a hundred grand less than what we thought it was worth, right? So we're gonna strip your second. So they have to let you in and do an independent appraisal if they're gonna do that. We sent the appraiser there and from the outside, this is a, high, this is a nice neighborhood track home on the inside. The air conditioning unit had, had fell through the roof and was in one of the rooms. And there was a motorcycle engine in the living room, no flooring, oh. and just on and off. And the back of the house, it's in Phoenix and they have no pool. All their other neighbors have a pool. And they have a turtle sanctuary in the backyard. Intentionally or? <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask, what do you mean they have a I, I don't know. Like a... So, <laughs> The appraisal like, says that we, scenario or? <laughs> I, I, I don't know, but it's, so the appraisal comes back that we're, we have no equity by $5,000. So if the borrower, can you still hear me? Yeah. We can hear you. Can't see you, but we can hear okay. you. Okay. We're good. So it says reconnecting. So, so if the borrower finishes this chapter 13, we're going to be stripped on a big one. So that's, Probably your biggest risk, I would say. Yeah. But just to throw this out, um, well, just because you're yeah. stripped doesn't mean the debt necessarily goes away. It just becomes unsecured. I just thought I'd throw that out there. But right. this is the condition right. of the house. There's probably really nothing to go after. But whatever. I was going to say, we actually had, um, well, on the last episode, Frank, yeah. talking about exactly that. Like, essentially, you can do wage coverage. I mean, there's all kinds of different other strategies after that that don't yeah. necessarily you know, throw the baby out with the bathwater type scenario, but it does, it, you know, obviously, like you said, the security, right. quote, unquote, right, that you did once have is now kind of, kind of, kind mm -hmm. of, out of right. Yeah, so that's, that's the big, biggest risk right there. Mm -hmm. Wonder if the turtles uh, are because, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, we tried to foreclose. That's when he filed the, the bankruptcy. <laughs> Wow. Uh, so we're just hoping he fails the bankruptcy. There's there's a very good chance he will not complete the plan. I mean, there's. Yeah. I heard only ten to twenty percent of borrowers complete the plan. So yeah. we'll see. Ten to twelve, like you mean nationwide type type scenario. Yeah. Yeah. Make all of the plan payments till the end. So this is potentially one that you would quote shelf. Because there's not a ton well, to do, right? And then <laughs> if he doesn't complete the plan, then you like you're back at it, right? Is that essentially? I mean, obviously you don't have another it's choice. A different type. It's an involuntary shelving because That's I don't have any more options. Right. <laughs> well, you still have to yeah. file proof of claim with the bankruptcy to make sure that you're still in the mix. So 
there, there yeah. is. Yeah, we've already had. So. Yeah, we've already had hearings and everything, and we're pretty much finished if he finishes the plan. But there's a good chance he will not complete the plan. So we'll we'll, we'll see. Interesting. I cannot wait to hear more about that one. Actually, I would like to like, keep us like up to date, like on the back end. I would love to, you know, like edit the show notes in the in the written part to be like, he did not complete the plan. The turtles. Yeah, are. this was uh, this was uh, from a pool of seven we bought, and all the other six have all worked out successfully. So we're waiting to see how this seventh one is. Lucky. I mean, we had some grand slams in that pool, so we'll see. I like it. That is fantastic. Uh, appreciate you guys very much for, for coming on the show. Like I said, talking seconds with us. Um, if anybody has any questions um, for you guys regarding any of this kind of stuff, um, give you the chance now to kind of like plug where they can reach you, all of that kind of stuff. Kimberly, where can, where can they reach you at to, uh, to ask you any and all things? That, uh, well, my uh, LLC is Inspired Capital Group. So my email address is really easy, kbf at Inspired Capital Group. I was just so clever that day. <laughs> um, plus, I'm all over Facebook, and I have a Facebook group called uh, Nationwide Note Closers. Um, so if you want to come and join and ask me questions, ask any of the members questions. just Also one of the best note meetups in the country, I hear. Which is oh, that is true. There is my uh, DFW uh, <laughs> note meetup. Um, very fun. <laughs> and we uh we also uh, we only meet um okay let me try this again we meet every month but only in person once a quarter so with all of those online things that we do it doesn't really matter where you live you can join yeah. in and we have Boring. almost 500 mm -hmm. members now so amazing cool. and wow. about you good sir i think the best way to reach me is by email my address is gabe g-a-b-e at surfcityinvestors.com. Delightful. And we will, of course, include all of those things in the show notes or notemba.com for you guys to be able to reach out to them. Uh, again, appreciate it. David, love that you're back, you know, uh, in, in town, as it were, essentially. And we can, we can have a solid internet connection yeah. to have you back. It's very, very good. Uh, anyway, guys, if this is your first time here, be sure to head over to iTunes, give us a rating, give, it, give us a review, and of course, subscribe. And we've mentioned it about 500 times already this episode, but any and all links to all of the things we've talked about will be on the show notes over at notabia.com. And remember, as always, be sure to tell five other people you know this week about the Notabia podcast. We'll catch you guys next week. Thanks. <laughs>